Hey, let's say you are making a video tutorial series on how to make a great shmup and it's going well, but you need some help with the design. That's right, you ask for help. That's what I did. Welcome to this third interview in this series of talks with kick ass indie devs making kick ass shmups. Our guest today is going to be none other than Charlene Excelsior. Yes, Queen Charlene herself will be here giving us some hot scoops on her yet unreleased game Bullet Sorceress. Before we Again, a quick disclaimer in the background you're gonna see some um, gameplay footage that footage is obviously uh, work in progress content provided by Charlene herself and you know that stuff is still no work in progress it's still bound to change so be mindful of that also as always this interview is going to be available as an audio only version so you can listen it uh, to it as a podcast and the link is going to be down in the doobly-doo but now without any further ado a warm welcome to Charlene Hey, how's it going, everybody? My name is Charlene Excelsior. I am a game developer, pixel artist, and animator who lives in the United States area around uh, Washington, Pacific Northwest. And uh, I do, to keep it simple, I, I make a lot of stuff, but I've got a couple projects going on right now. The main one, which I'm pretty sure we're talking about right now, being Bullet Sorceress. Uh, full title, Bullet, Bullet Sorceress Shooting Action Carnage. You got to have the, the nice little subtitle there. Yeah, and it's a it's a pleasure to be invited. It was a it was a bit of a surprise actually. I didn't think I was gonna get invited for something like this for something that's so secretive and not very uh, not very seen. But maybe this will be the first time a lot of people will get to see it. Well, we're gonna have some 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 really spicy scoops today. I hope. Yeah, maybe some exclusive some exclusive content never before seen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, I really wanted to have you on the show because not just because of Bullet Sorcerers, but also you're very active in, in various discords and, and you also, I think, run the wiki, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I run the uh, I run shmups.wiki. I've been running it for the last, I want to say, two years now. Well, so it's like, I guess you could call it like my little pandemic project because there, <laughs> there was a lot of clamoring in the community about like wanting a wiki, but no one wanted to do it. And I was just like, I'll do it. So and I did it and now we've got it and now everyone loves it. So that's awesome. Somebody sometimes has to step up, step up, right? You know, I find myself in that position a lot where it's just, yeah, I got to be the one and that's just how it is. So I've kind of just accepted this part of my life. Uh, that's true. That's true. And also maybe to link, um, to link you to the, to one of the, um, uh, developer school we had previously on the show. So we had Bog Hawk on our first episode and you also work with Bog Hawk on, uh, Mechanical Star Astra, right? Yes. That's a collaborative project between me and him. He's the, he's the heavy lifter on that one he's the one who does all the level design and whatnot for that i mostly write the scenario and i do the art and design like the mechs and stuff like that that you see in the game yeah so so far the, the kind of pe people that we had on a show were more like programming focused but you're more like artist driven right like uh, art yeah driven. The, I, the way that i put it is that i really like making video games and i really 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 hate programming <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like it's like one of those things that just like the only way that I can learn how to program is just by like copy pasting some code and just like messing with it until it does something close to close to what I want it to do. Uh, and then that's why I just have other people do the, the coding for me <laughs> and I just do all the I art mean, for them. The secret is that even the people who do program just do it the same way. They just like maybe have yeah. higher tolerance for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hear that a lot actually, which has been it's actually been very illuminating to me. Just be like, man, no one no one likes doing this. <laughs> no one knows what they're doing is <laughs> Yeah. We're all we're it's, all flying by the seat of our pants. That's true, that's true. Uh, okay, yeah, so uh, maybe to explain now the shmup that we want to kind of discuss today, um, because that's the one that I, was, I kind of wanted to focus on, uh, which is a shmup called Bullet Sorceress. So let me give you maybe like a, a summary from, from my perspective, and then you can maybe uh, fill in the details that I, I don't quite understand or didn't get right. So from what I understand, it's like a top-down um, vertical scrolling shmup where you are some kind of crazy... Um, a gun wielding vampire hunter sorceress kind of person who is pretty badass and shoots like with two guns at the same time kind of like in i don't know i, I to me i i'm reminded of like uh, the enemy alucard you know with a with a giant gun the the, the vampire with a giant guard yeah uh, yeah uh, or um uh, like uh, uh what's what's the uh, equilibrium 
like a, a okay, I can see that. I can see that Christian Bale kind of thing, you know, reaching the guns in yeah. different directions. You know, yeah, I can definitely stuff. see that. I can see that there might be a little unintentional, uh, unintentional influence I mean, there. I mean, it's it's all kind of like you know, marinating the same, the same yeah, kind yeah. Of, uh, it's all part of it. It's all part of the same family. Yeah, and and, and third reference maybe like the underworld movies. You know, where it's also like this, 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 this girl who's just like shooting and 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 killing vampires or some kind of yeah, yeah. and so forth. Yeah, definitely leading into the goth. Yeah, yeah, but but more, certainly more, a more, um, I know, B movie style <laughs> with lots of blood. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and skeletons and skeletons, you know, shooting the skeletons, they explode into into thousands of of uh, bones and and stuff like that. So this is a kind of game. And something that is really fascinating to me about this, because it's kind of like unusual for shmup, is that you can also, because you have two guns, you can kind of like shoot in different directions as well. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I feel like that's a pretty. I feel like you pretty much nailed basically everything that I would that I would say about it. Except I've got a little little flowerly flowerly words okay. to say about stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely like one of those games that has a big focus on like really really cool characters and really bombastic action because those are just like those are the kinds of games that I grew up with and that's the kind of stuff that I like animating and doing stuff for. Um, but yeah, you play you play as the titular sorceress who is a half vampire, half ghost, and she is like a she's like part of a, a vampire clan in this isle that's on the it's like off in Europe, like in a place called the Devil's Sea. It's like I know that like, place right like, across uh, the corner here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure you've been there once or twice before. And there's like a there's like a little clouded area, and inside of that is the the Isle of Gunsylvania. Where all oh, of, these, of course. <laughs> yeah, where these mysterious vampires live that have like this clan of just like super badass vampires, and this is kind of like this is kind of like in the future after like a big massive like story crawl event happens, which is actually described in the intro of the game, um, where basically the, where she gets her soul like dragged into hell, and then a couple years like a couple hundred years pass and then she's awakened once again by some meddling from a mysterious individual who she's trying to find because she's angry that they woke her from her slumber and has now she has to get all these demons off of her land and take it back and then maybe maybe have some unfinished business with some of the folks who may have made that happen to her 500 years ago you, yeah it's, maybe, it sounds like maybe. she has yeah yeah and yeah, you've pretty much nailed it with the gameplay. The main focus is that she has two guns and you can like aim in multiple directions and you can also lock your aim by holding onto like the focus shot button. And there's also um, a couple other mechanics that are like a little more hidden in there, but are like also really important. Like she has the ability to like focus power into her guns by not shooting. So it mm. just like makes them stronger. And then you can like fire off these burst shots that go through walls and they go through like enemies and stuff like that and they do a ton of damage and um when she has like a lot of blood she can like convert it into like power energy that is basic that basically puts her into hyper mode where she can like cancel bullets and like generate a bunch of skulls because she's all about collecting skulls that's like the big scoring mechanic of the game basically where you collect you collect a bunch of skulls until you collect enough to make like a big skull when you hyper and then you just have like all these big blue skulls all over the screen it's just, like whoop, 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 collecting all these skulls but every time yeah. you hyper you also make the game harder so there's a little uh. bit of like like balancing out like how much different the like difficulty of the game can be based on how much you use these like really strong mechanics um and yeah that's basically like a good a good format for like the kind of game that i'm trying to make here because it's also uh uniquely on foot which is also a thing that a lot of shmups tend to not do. And because it's on foot, I've made the environments tangible. So instead of it just being screens of just like backgrounds that scroll, there's like actual objects on screen also that has like depth and physicality and like uh, rigidness. And you can like shoot at them to like destroy them and stuff like that. And sometimes they have items inside and sometimes they just like take visual damage. Uh, environmental damage is actually kind of a big thing in this game because there's a lot of like interacting with the environment so it actually really influences the level design too because it like it really changes how i have to place enemies because now, like these spots where you can almost kind of take cover to like hide from bullets and then like skirt your way out and then like use some of your other mechanics to, like shoot through enemies like through these walls and like all this other stuff there's a lot of there's a lot of like there's a lot of uh intricate 
things that I have to think about in the level design of this game specifically. That's been a lot of fun to mess around with. Yeah, I mean, um, environment, environmental objects is uh, like uh, obstacles, not something that you see quite often in shmups. Also like this idea of walking, like some shmups did it before, but uh, it always felt kind of like uh, not quite as, as um, you know, not quite the, the, the kind of like main focus of shmups so far. Yeah, exactly. And, and super interesting. Super interesting for that you went decided to explore this specific space. Just like to, to clarify, so you are kind of like the designer and and you do the graphic design and narratives kind of stuff, but you also uh, you, you don't program. So you have a second person at least on on the team, right? Yes, um, I have a I have a longtime friend and collaborator named Chloe who does most of the programming for all the games under the Danger Heart uh, Danger Heart Entertainment banner, which is mm -hmm. like what we were which is what we're going before we were Alpha Six Productions, and then over time I like as we like changed and like thought more about things and stuff like that, I thought it was a little bit of a, of a outdated name because it kind of represented like an era that I'm not really in anymore. So then we switched to like danger heart entertainment, which I think is a little bit more of a fitting name for the kind of games that we make. Cause it's like very like, like the logo is like very angular and it's like very stylized. And that's like the exact kind of games that I want to make with this like little two person studio that we run. But uh, yeah, she basically does all the programming, like all the heavy lifting on that end. Um, and usually she'll program in a way where um, she'll like put together like these sort of basic tools that I can use to um, use to design levels and use to like test out concepts and think of like ideas that I think might or might not work. So it gives me like a little contained area where I can easily test these things and swap out assets and stuff like that without going back and forth between like the IDE and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, um, I saw some of the tools and I'm actually super excited to jump, um, jump in there. It's, it's, it's kind of like super excited, but before we get in there, just like two, uh, two more questions. So um, you've, I saw you made first the announcement in 2020, is that right? It was in September of 2020 is when we first like announced the thing. And in that, in that time, I think we had only been working on the game for like, like four or five days when we made like, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. It was just like, I just like slammed out some assets and then because we've, we've made these kinds of games before where we like put together, like almost, almost, we almost put together like an engine on top of the engine in order to facilitate creating like the ideas and like building the concepts and stuff like that. So it was kind of like, even like this version of the game with like the footage that I've given you is like, I still consider it like a proof of concept sort of thing, like showing like these are like the basic ideas and like the and like there's going to be like other refinements and stuff like that. But like the basic core, just like showing like this is this is like what the game is like in summary, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And we do a lot of like that. We've done a lot of that, like refining and like building like different tools and stuff like that in order to like in or like basically like building a lot of tools in order to make it easier to build future tools and understand like the process of doing something like that and then just like crunching it down and making it work for the kind of project that it needs to be for. Uh, definitely something I can like, uh, like that seems like the, the way I also operate in my head. Uh, also, maybe also, maybe, I don't know, maybe in, unconsciously I was also inspired by just by seeing the kind of tools that you, you posted. And because it's like, I, I feel like you kind of want to have like this comfortable environment when you're doing like the creative decisions, right? You don't want to be like bogged down by the, by the uh, friction with the with the engine. Speaking of yeah. which, what kind of engine are you using? Um, so this version of the game is made in Game Maker Studio, um, mm -hmm. and like it's it's like it's like Game Maker Studio with an asterisk at the end because like a lot of stuff is just like raw coded without using like any of the Game Maker features or any of the tools or anything like that. We kind of we kind of just like stepped around it and then are mm -hmm. kind of just like programming stuff using Game Maker as a container. But over the last month or so, we actually made the switch to Godot. So we're learning how to use all of that stuff and like move it around in a context that works for us in that way. What made you switch from GameMaker to Godot? Um, I think the last couple years, we've just been like working on making these games in GameMaker. And um, I, think it, I think it all starts with Joylancer, the game that we still are still working on and have been working on for the last like almost, almost a decade now. Um, oh, it's just wow. like... Yeah, and it's just one of those things where it's like, as we were working on the game, we started running into like really hard walls that we couldn't get over that were largely due in part to the, uh, the limitations of the engine that we were using, which is a big part of why we started like figuring out ways to sidestep those limitations and get around them. 
we can actually make the kind of games that we want to make. Uh, and a big part of that is largely my fault because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bit of an, an artiste and I have a lot of ideas and sometimes I make a lot of art and, uh, Sometimes, sometimes games don't like it when you put a lot of art in them. <laughs> too too much art. <laughs> it decreased yeah, the it, amount of art. <laughs> yeah, it's just like there was, there was a certain point where we were working on Joy Lancer where like there's just there was just so much just raw art and animation in the game that any time I like added or edited an, an animation, it had to go through and re-export the entire set of like sprite sheets and like sprite data and stuff like that so i would just i would like exit the game and then be like all right i need to fix this sprite right here and then i would fix it and then i'd be like all right time to build and it would be like five to ten minutes of just sitting there waiting for it to build until it actually builded and then hope to god that there is no horrible glitch or bug that shows up in the process because you just want to test swapping out one art asset and uh that that's that doesn't spark joy at a certain point it, do, it doesn't spark joy it's not it's not interesting it's not fun and it just makes doing basic things really difficult and so we've been like experimenting with doing the stuff outside of the system which has made it a lot faster um it's like trimmed down a lot of that fat it's made not having to go back and forth between like building the game and then exiting the game so you can build it again after you edit like two lines of code or whatever or or you edit a script, you have to exit the game and start it again. Um, whereas Godot, you can just edit it while you're working on it, and then it's it's, it's fine. So, <laughs> and it, it, I think in the long because of, because of the games that we make are like becoming so like they're they're like production. You know what I mean? They're not like you know let's let's bang out a thing in like two or three months. These are like things that take like one to two years at the minimum to make if you want to do it right. So yeah, that's how it goes. Yeah. And then because of that, like, there's a lot of content that we put into our games because I'm, like, I'm, like, very, I'm very much, I'm level design brain. So, like, I can't just make a game that has, like, like I can't make, like, a shmup that has five levels and just, that's it. You know, that's just, that's, that's not enough to me. That's why I have, like, Five missions. levels not enough? You, you, you want more? Yeah, I mean, it's, when I play, it's enough. But when I make something, it's not <laughs> enough. So there's got to, so there's got to be more. And also, just because the level design process is so iterative and experimental to me that I come up with a lot of different ideas. And instead of like jamming them all into like one or two levels and like having a really cluttered level, I like for each level to have a specific focus behind it. Like whether it be like an enemy type or like a certain type of bullet pattern or like a, like a, like an event that happens, like some sort of like fancy bombastic thing, like a, I don't know, like a dragon comes out of the ground or something like that. Like usually I want these things to be like focused and like nice and tight and compact. So that way also when you go through and replay it multiple times, which is something that I do with every single game that I've ever liked, I've probably beaten it a million. I've beaten Devil May Cry 3 like a hundred times. I, I, I own, oh, yeah, I own, I own eight, May Cry, copies right. that, no, eight copies of that game. I have it on every platform and all of those files are very, very far in. So I play, I play games a lot a lot so when i'm like making games i think about the kind of person that i am where i like to replay games a lot and i found that um that you can get a lot out of like certain ideas if you just like give them to the player in like bite-sized little chunks yeah. so like in the uh in the current uh like alpha alpha build of the game level stage one is actually four stages and it's four mm -hmm. stages and each stage is about like a minute a minute and a half long sometimes okay. shorter so it's yeah. like instead of having like one long like five to six minute stage, you have these shorter stages with breaks in between. Because especially with the kind of game that I want to make, which is very fast paced and aggressive, uh, it can be very very daunting and very exhausting to play through a really long level that's also really hard and really fast paced. So giving the player that like break in between where they can just like reset a little bit or think about the next part of the stage, um, I think is like. That's like the basic idea that I like to go for with most of the games that I make. So everything's usually like uh, you have, I have like an idea and then sections of that idea that all come together to make like a cohesive thing. Oh, okay. So we're already uh, in your, in, in, into your design process. So you've sent me some uh, exclusive behind the scene footage of the kind of tools that you are employing to that you already uh, teased a little bit. So what I'm looking at right now is, is like a video where you see the game in the center 
uh, which is kind of like vertical scrolling, kind of like um, um, a portrait mode, right? Is yeah. Portrait? yeah, portrait mode. But the entire screen is landscapes. So on the left side, you have some tools, like a menu. On the right side, you have like some icons, uh, I, which I think represent like the enemies that you place into the stage. Yeah, so basically, uh, the editor is broken up into a couple distinct parts. It's usually, uh, it's, like pro it's like props, which are like, all of the objects that get strewn around a bunch of, around the stage, most of them, most of them are physical objects. Some of them are not. Uh, some of them are destructible. Others are not. And that's just kind of just like you just kind of know if it is or not because I don't have any like fancy display because I don't really need it because I'm the one working on the levels. So I already know all that stuff. Um, and then there's like a spawner section where when you click that one, it changes those icons to like all the enemies that are currently in the game. And then uh -huh. you can just like pick the you pick the one that you want to place, and then you can just like place them as many times as you want. Uh, and then there's the terrain section, which is the part, it's, it's basically like the basic flat background with nothing on it whatsoever, aside from like a vague path or just like some sort of like visual decoration that makes it look like something. Like the, like there's, the way that the level is built is that I lay out the terrain and then I put objects on top of it and then I put spawners on top of it. And then I add events, which is the last tab. And that is, and that allows you to control things like the way that the screen scrolls. If some sort of like event happens, like it can trigger an explosion or a sound effect, or like a it can trigger cutscenes. It can trigger bosses to appear, uh, various little things like that. It can trigger, it can trigger uh, the screen stop to stop scrolling, which I take advantage of in some levels to have like focused encounters where enemies are coming down and the screen isn't scrolling, so I can like have those little stops. And then when there's no enemies anymore, it just resumes at the speed that it was going previously. I can slow the screen down. I can speed it up, stuff like that. And that's like the basic overview. And then there's a play test button that just goes straight into the level. OK, so that's that's also an interesting. So so you can, whenever you make changes, you can just press a button and you immediately start that level, yeah, right? Yeah, you instantly start at that level. And you can also, it's a, it's a little glitchy in this version, but you can like start in like the middle of a stage and then like make a change and then like go back to the middle of the stage and then hit the play test button and it will start you right in that middle of the stage. And you can jump out of the playing back to the editor at yeah. any point? Yeah, you can just, there's a there's a hotkey that you can hold to go into the editor and there's also a temporary option for it in the start menu also. So it's very easy to access regardless of if I'm playing on gamepad or not. This is incredible. This is, this <laughs> is amazing. It? It's awesome. <laughs> it is, it's, like, it's like revolutionized the way I make games. I'm like spoiled by it now. No, I also, I'm kind of blown away because this is like the third interview I'm doing. And so far, the approaches that the different developers had were so widely different. And especially comparing that to Barcock's approach, which uses, who uses the same engine as you are using. But Barcock does everything inside Game Maker. Yeah. And, and you have like this super comfortable, super polished, in-depth editor that that allows you to do, you know, specify everything and to get a preview of everything. So something I'm super interested in is, for example, when you spawn an enemy. So that's a spawner thing, right? Yes. You also get like a preview of like the trajectory that the enemy will will uh, will describe. Is that correct? Yeah. And there's a, there's a couple ways that that can that can function. Uh, and it's, it's, it can be entirely based on the enemy also, because some enemies have like multiple behavior types. The basic one that everyone can do is like a path type where you can like set, you can like set like custom paths that the enemy will fly on. And you can like set all these different nodes that will determine whether or not they do actions or continue or be terminated and what have you, what have you. Um, and then there's also a type one, which I show in the video, which is kind of like, it, it does like a, like a, like a curve path that you can mm -hmm. set or yeah, like yeah. straight paths and stuff like that. So it's like, if I'm, if I'm going to place an enemy and I just want to have it just go straight down or just like go straight into a path, I would just set it to type one and then input some coordinates and then it just does it. And I don't have to think about like the exact actions that are being committed on like every single node. And then for fancier enemies, like the, the gun dead, like the machine gun dead, those are enemies that have a little bit more um, behavior to them. And they function, they almost kind of function a little bit more like a, like a sort of character action enemy where they have like, sp they have like spawn points and they have like multiple actions. And they usually like, the way that they move is like usually pretty predetermined, but they can also react based on like positioning and stuff like that. Which we haven't we haven't done any of that in this version of the game, but that would be like a thing where it's like if you're up close to an enemy, 
they will like have a higher chance of like doing like a physical attack to like get you away but then there's like advantages to getting up close because you can build up more blood by like touching enemies like while you're shooting and stuff like that so so just uh, onto that so so like if you're designing like a boss fight for example something that has more complex behavior is that also something that you're doing in here or is at some point do you have to jump into into coding and it's a little it's a little bit of it's a little bit of both most of the bosses are most of the bosses are scripted in some sort of way so there's usually like a degree of like going in and altering code um like all the attacks that the bosses have have like individual names associated with them so i treat them almost kind of like special moves if it was like Mm. like a like a fighting game or something like that they've all got like a list of special moves and every time they trigger a special move it does like the pattern um but yeah those are usually on timers and uh the timers i can like change the numbers however i want but i usually have to do that part in the actual ide and not in the editor although the, the editor that we were going to start working on before we switched to Giddo was going to have all those values inside of the enemy. So it would be easy to adjust those while I'm testing the boss out. So that's also an interesting uh, question. So because this is like a super elaborate editor, and I'm sure like this is something that is constantly being developed throughout the development as well. Like you evolve the editor to suit your needs. So yeah. assuming like you you constantly are in contact with Chloe and, and asking and pestering her for, for features that you want to have, right? Yes, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, like a lot of we've been we've been doing this for so long now that like she's got like a pretty good idea of the things that I need and like the kind of way that my brain works when I'm designing levels and concepts and even like mechanics and stuff like that. Um, so we've we've kind of just gotten gotten it down to just like a work, but we've just done this for so long with each other that we just kind of we just kind of get it. You know what I mean? Yeah, your brain synced up basically. Yeah, like we've been we've been doing this stuff together since. We were like, like seventeen. I want to say, like we met. We okay. actually met on. We met online like pretty early on in like the game maker forums and stuff like that. I had like a like a little like a little side forum that I had offshooted off of another forum that I was on. This is you, I might be I might be dating myself right now by talking about forums, but oh, you're in good company here. It's fine. <laughs> how it is? This is how it is out here. Uh, but yeah, we had like I had like all these like different forum offshoots that had all these various communities, and there was one forum that I made that I wanted specifically to focus on game development and artwork because that was like a thing that I was really into at the time and obviously still am into this day so um and yeah we would just like hang out on that forum a whole lot and we would just like come up with ideas and she would like she would just like build stuff like really quickly and it would be super high quality and I would like just put together assets really quickly and super high quality because we both like focus in on the things that we like and then just like as we sort of dabbled into each other's fields we got like a better feel of how to do things on both sides so now she's she's got like really good animation chops now because she's just spent so much time around me animating constantly and likewise i'm a lot better at reading code just in general it actually is like not a super difficult thing for me anymore compared to before it was just like this is just this is just runes on this is just runes on stone i have no idea what any of this means and now it like actually kind of makes sense so Having that kind of relationship has actually really benefited both of us in a way that has also enabled us to like do these things a lot quicker and a lot more efficiently and do them in ways that are like way better performing also. Um, so ha- and are easy to fix. That's a very important thing. They have to be easy to fix because otherwise, otherwise it kills the project. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, how are you guys communicating with each other? So how, how is the collaboration work like, like in a practical sense? Um, we've actually we've actually lived together for the last couple of years. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking like, oh, maybe some kind of board or yeah. something. Okay. Yeah, no, it's a it's a very very easy privilege to just be within within range of each other pretty pretty easily. Okay. Um, and she's gonna be she's gonna be moving soon, but we'll still be able to just like link up together because we live in the same we live in the same city. So it's like, why not? You know, most of my work nowadays I do on a Surface tablet, so I can just take my work with me wherever I go. So it doesn't really actually matter where I go. I can just do stuff whenever I want. Yeah, on a Microsoft Surface, you mean the the, the notebook from Microsoft? Yeah, like a, like a Surface, the Surface Pro Four. It's like a really old, like janky model that I got at a that I got at a pawn shop for like three hundred dollars. Yeah, I got um, I got one here right here. It, <laughs> yeah, see, there you go, right on. Uh, but yeah, it pretty much does everything that I need it yeah. to do. Um, and at this point, the only reason I need to upgrade is because the battery the battery on mine is just 
it's 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 not cutting it. It's like yeah. it's like unplugged for like thirty minutes and it's dead. It's, so it, that that won't do. It's a huge problem with modern mo- notebooks. They kind of like are not meant meant to last. Sadly. Yeah, they got. I mean, you know, if they made them last, why, why would you buy a new one? That's true. That's how it works. Hopefully, the EU will maybe change something about this. They're already attacking the cell phones. Maybe they're going to go for notebooks next, replaceable batteries. <laughs> like fingers yeah. crossed. You know, I, I hope. I hope so. I hope so because it that stuff is that stuff is rough in the United States. I can tell you yeah, that. Yeah. I, I saw something on the on the editor. I'm like, I, I'm I'm going into the details now because that's something I also been developing myself, and and I'm kind of like uh, curious to see uh, to know some details here. So I see there is like a way to mirror enemies. So is that something that you have something like where you can just select a bunch of enemies and say like just copy those enemies over to the other side, or how does that work? Um, so the way that works is that um, it works on every it works on like individual enemies, but you can also have enemies be in like a group. I think it's I think it's labeled team in the mm-hmm. editor. And you just increase that number, and it just adds like another. It just adds another guy, and you can also offset the X and the Y, so you can like put them in formations, and you can even make them come out in like delayed formations, or you can make them like have higher speed than the other ones, like following up. So you can have them like progressively increase in speed. So there's like all these different ways you can arrange these enemies. And then when you turn the mirror tab on, it just puts that exact same arrangement of enemies that you put in there just in reverse. Mm. So it caught all that team data and stuff like that also. So if you have like five enemies and you have them you have them offset in a way that they make like a diagonal line, you turn on the mirror and then the other side of enemies will do the exact same thing. So you have like these like X pattern of enemies that just like swoop down and it takes like, 40 seconds to, to do that so <laughs> and, and you have to do it a lot right you sometimes have to do this a lot because quite often it's like one thing happens on this one side and then let's try it again but now from the other direction you know yeah but then sometimes i'll also sometimes i won't actually use the mirror for those things because like maybe i'll have the one that pops up on the left do like a slightly different behavior mm. and so then i'll just make that like a separate enemy with its own like with its own behavioral like coordinates and stuff like that Super, super cool. I don't know. I don't, I don't know the technical stuff, but uh, when uh, all the stuff, uh, I guess, is gets saved in some kind of file on locally, is that's that's not something that you can maybe later on open up in Game Maker, right? It's not like the Game Game, Game Maker native scene. Format. Yeah, it's like a. It's basically it's basically like a unique file that has like a bunch of just like stuff. It's just like random data mm-hmm. in there that translates into being the thing that it needs to be when it's loaded by the editor. Mm-hmm. So you can have like I can make like. Um, and this is usually like how I would um, sort like the files that I have is that I put I have all these level files and then I put those on Dropbox and then I will sync those like back and forth as I make changes and then just like bring those data files in there. So that way, if there's also like a time where there's enough changes between the version that she has and the version that I have that there's like like code desync, um, I can just get the new source and then just take my levels and just plug them in and they just work. Mm-hmm. Provided that there's like nothing that has been like messed with in that part of the code since then. Yeah, that's that's I imagine that that might be a bit of a difficult thing when some 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 fundamental changes about about some of the levels that uh, you you have to be careful. We especially learned that uh, working on Joy Lancer because that game has like so many levels and it's a lot of data to manage and it would it really sucks when those when you lose levels in between like source like source things because you know, maybe I was up at 3 a.m. working on a level or two. Maybe I did some things, but then the source is outdated. So then I have to, like, go through the rigmarole of, like, copy and pasting, like, Game Maker files. And it just feels, Ugh. like, janky and, like, it's, like, half working. And it's just like, oh, this is not it. This is not it. It's not the, not the great foundation to build, you know, a complex game on top of when suddenly starts, things start breaking. And it's like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, it was just, it's just like it got it got so bad with that to the point where we just had to just like we we were updating that game like every week for a while oh. on early access. And then we had to like slow down to like two weeks and then like a month. And then it's just like, guys, this this stuff is so broken right now. And we're like about to get kicked out of our apartment so we'll we'll be back when we're when we're able (laughs) and yeah just like going through the process of making that game we learned so much stuff which is a big part of why we switched to like making these tools because you know when you when you think about like building tools in a game it sounds like so much work and it is a lot of work but it trims down so much work later on that it's like depending on the kind of game you're making, it's almost worth it to like throw in that like 
first like three to six months of just like building something that will help you build the thing that you need to build. Because a lot of the times if you try to do it inside of the thing that you're doing it, like, and you know that it's not going to work, it's, you're going to have a bad time. No, but also like, not, not just like, because it's make it easier, but, but I feel like it's also making, allows you to make better creative decisions, right? Because it's like what you, what you talked yeah. about, like when, when it's so tedious, uh, to get another graphic into the game or change a graphic in the game, then you will like start weighing, thinking it's just, should I do it? Ah, it's, maybe it's fine, you know? And then maybe you will exactly. leave something janky inside because it was just too much effort to change it. Yeah, or like maybe you have like a very specific boss character that does all these things that like don't fit within the confines of like the system that you created for stuff. And then so it ends up having all these weird inconsistencies, like stuff like we'll have like a, like a, I remember one thing that happened a fair amount on Joy Lancer was that I would like, I would design a boss and then I would put together like the framework for it. And then we'd put it in the game. And because it wasn't, it did, it was like, it, was, it would miss a parent object or it would like, or just, there'd just be like some variable that didn't get counted. And because of that, like certain rules that work for everything would just not work for that enemy or that boss or this specific thing because it's like, like in its own, it's, it's like, in its, it's in its own world basically. And then like messing with all that stuff, it just it just gets too too nasty. It's like it's like you mess with one thing and then it just like has a ripple effect on like every single other thing that you do. And the next thing you know, like your enemies aren't spawning and you don't know why they're not spawning because you added this this one enemy that just broke your entire game. Yep, yep, definitely, definitely happened that happened that to me before. <clears throat> <laughs> Um, just so to maybe to, to switch a little bit to a different topic. So I understand you build a level and you put all sorts of objects in there and then you add all those enemy spawns as, as well. And then you have like all those super detailed tools to modify the enemy behavior. Uh, but maybe going back to the, um, the level, to the background, the actual background, I, I saw that like using like huge chunks, you build the uh, levels out of huge chunks, which are basically half of the screen. Is that correct? Yeah, it, uh, I think they're at 240 exactly, actually, in, uh, in, uh, in height. The width can be a little bit more flexible, although in this version of the game, we don't have, like, we don't have, like, the adjusting width to, like, make certain levels, like, wider than others, but that's, like, a, that's, like, a planned feature. So it scrolls sideways when you walk sideways, right? Yeah, or you can have, like, levels that are, like, some levels are a little more narrow and others are, like, more wide, so that way I can, like, fit in, like, paths and have, like, little weird stuff that could potentially happen. Um, but yeah, basically it's, I put together like these chunks of terrain that are just like these big pieces of art that I just like, that I just render out just raw with pixel art. And then usually I will have like different sections of these that are like part of like a category of things. So in this case, it's like the, the basic, uh, green graveyard sort of background. It's comprised of a couple of these chunks. And then there's like another one that's like a it's like a pur it's like more purplish, but it's like the same background basically. Um, and then I just stack those on top of each other in the editor, and then arrange them however I want. And I can like make all these different like changes, or I can like I think in the editor in the clip that I show you, there's like a part where it just like very abruptly transitions into like a sort of like inner underground castle something that I was working on, just because just like just to show that it could be like and any series of environments can be connected together. Basically, it's not like grouped in a way where you have to do these things on top of these things, which does open up a lot of potential to do potentially really creative things with like level formats and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, the basic version is that it's just like a bunch of big pictures that you stack on top of each other that have nothing on them, basically. Interesting. So what did you make uh, uh, choose like these these huge uh, tiles instead of because usually games are made of like tiny little tiles and you create like images out of them. But what make you make the tiles so gigantic? So I find with shmups a lot of times when you're making like these backgrounds for like these levels and stuff like that, especially when you look at like the really, the really high quality old school arcade games, those backgrounds are just these enormous single pieces of art that are just like, just like, like, 4,000, 5,000 pixels in height and just like super wide. It's just like a single continuous piece. And I was just like, I like the energy, but how can we do this in a way that doesn't require me to put a single 4,000 pixel image in my game that will definitely harm the performance of this game? Yeah. And so the way that I approached it was to just cut them into these little tiny pieces. 
And as I was doing that, I came to the realization that that actually allows me to get a lot more out of the asset by having it be like sort of nondescript and not not detailless, but like it has one specific, it has one or two specific details and that's it. Mm. And then because of that, I can arrange them in any way that I want. So I could use one background in like 20 levels by itself, just by arranging the just by arranging the tiles in different ways and by working in the actual physical objects also, because like you can have, I could even, I could do a level where the, where like one, one level and another level, they'll have the exact same terrain, but the way that the objects are laid out is different. And that fundamentally changes what kind of level you're playing. It's a completely different level now. And I'm able to do that without using the exact same background as like, like it's not, it's not using like, the whole stage one it's like a a bunch of pieces and arrangements of stage one that allow you to make a bunch of stages and i found that that really works with the kind of way that i make games which is like very much like i don't want to i don't want to say improvise but maybe that's the way to word it because i do make like improvised music also so that's just kind of how i live my life (laughs) but it's like uh it's like in a way with games like this, where there's so much art and there's so much focus on the art, like the art is a very, very, very important part of this game. Um, you have to be very intricate with the way that you make your levels. And it's very hard to design a level and then make art for it. You almost have to design that level in your head and then make the art for it. And then hope that when you actually put the level together, you don't change your mind and then have to redo this big fat chunk of level. You just swap out the objects and arrange it differently and then you don't have to worry about it it makes it a lot faster and it gives me a lot more room to do more things with the objects that i do have so i can make like a lot of content with very little actual content Hmm. yeah i mean that's something that definitely um i also noticed like um uh, sometimes you just cannot really just sit down and uh, you know come up with some ideas and then just create like the waterfall uh, design uh, concept you kind of have to start doing something and then see what you created and let that inform further decisions as you go along right yes exactly it's not unlike uh like making a painting or a drawing or writing an essay or anything like that you want to you want to make like the first draft that gives the idea of the thing that you're trying to make and then you refine it further as you go along but having those basic tools that help you do that first draft really quickly makes it so you can test these things out and then when you go through and do like the final draft and make it like more detailed and like unique and stuff like that like make it more original you have like the functioning bedrock of ideas that you've already tested out you already know it's good you already know that this is what you want to commit to and then you're able to just commit to it without it becoming a huge problem later on in development when you inevitably change your mind because we're creative people and we change our mind all the time and you know every month that passes we're a different person and we might not think that that idea is cool anymore you know (laughs) that's true that's true maybe sometimes you're even right you and maybe that idea is not cool anymore (laughs) um some one thing uh, you already teased that um, um, before our uh, we started the interview. Uh, one thing that is missing a little bit in these, this elaborate, amazing editor is like, how do you make bullet patterns? Yeah. Okay. So the bullet patterns are built in like another like separate editor that basically it, it lets me see like the the actual bullet and like the the graphic of the bullet and it will preview like a like a like an angle that the bolts will go in. And you can also set like multiple bullets and like delayed bullets and you can like set offsets to like make all these pathways and stuff like that. And you can even, you can even assign multiple bullets inside of a bullet pattern. So you can have like a sequence of bullets, Mm. like go off at once. You can make like these really interesting, like intricate and fancy patterns without getting too, getting too like in the weeds of just like trying to make like a specific enemy, like create this bullet pattern. Like you can still do that, but you can also just like, smush it down into just like a single thing that just just like you just call this bullet and then it just does the thing and so you have like this dedicated editor that's that where you set up all the parameters and you can preview what's what the pattern will look like yeah exactly and i can also because this game has like a a fluid like difficulty system each pattern actually has like five potential difficulties that it can be set to so you can have like a like even like the basic like single bullet pattern like when you crank the difficulty up 
that bullet pattern will change into like something that could be completely different. Ah. And that's also when the game gets like really aggressive too. So it's just like, it's like, the, the the shmup heads might get this. It's a game that starts out as like a like a toa plan psyche game, and then like as the difficulty increases, it gets like a little bit more cave, where it's just like bullets ah. everywhere all of a sudden. And so actually, there's like a balance between like making these bullet patterns and like testing them out on every difficulty to make sure that these patterns are like solid throughout, and then using that to also influence the way that I design waves. Because that's also a thing that I did not include in the uh, in the level editor itself is that you can create enemy spawns that only spawn if you're on a certain difficulty. So if you have like the difficulty higher up, you can have like another row of enemies that spawn like at the exact same time that like the basic enemies spawn. So it can get like really really chaotic if you like really like ratchet the difficulty up by abusing like the really strong mechanics. And difficulty is controlled by some kind of rank system. Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a rank system that is like the the basic way that it works is that it goes up by spending hypers. It goes down by like a bunch of various <sighs> other things. And um, there's like there's like other ways that can be increased also. Um, and you can also there's like custom rule sets that you can do in this game. So you can like also set it to be at a certain rank for like whatever level that you want. So you can have like challenge runs where you do like level 1-3 but you crank the rank up all the way and you can also lock it so even if you do like bombing or dying to decrease the rank it stays at the rank that you set it at so it's like you can make like these really really hard versions of these levels that just get absolutely crazy and it adds like some replay value to the game where like you can do like the arcade mode but then you set the rank really high by default and that also influences the scoring in some ways because you get like higher score bonuses based on like the level of rank that you're at this dives quite nicely into like a question i had about difficulty how do you design like which which order do you design the difficulty in? do you first design like a normal difficulty and then you add the additional enemies on top to design the more difficult level or do you start with like a difficult uh, game and then tone it down for for lower ranks? i would say i would say it heavily depends on like the kind of level that i'm making if i'm because there's like a there's like a dichotomy of levels in bullet sorceress where you have like the like arcade levels and like the story levels and you have like the challenge levels the challenge levels are usually designed based on what the parameters of that challenge is but if there's like no nothing special then i'll usually just start at like the base the base rank, rank level zero and then just design around like the idea of the player potentially escalating their rank at certain points because there's like there's like a certain general idea of where i like design things to make it so that the player might want to try this at this certain point And then like giving them this additional mm -hmm. challenge on top of that if they choose to do that and then making it easier for them if they choose not to do so so you can make like some levels really easy you make other levels like really really hard if you want to um i think with the arcade levels where it's like more based on running them all in a row i'm usually more thinking about a general idea of what the average player rank would be at around that time and then if it's like more if it's like mi more middling i'll probably design it around the rank being more like that and then just also check the beginner and the expert levels to make sure that they're not like crazy or like baby easy or anything like that so it, it depends it depends really it depends on the kind of thing that i'm going for with that specific level so does that also mean that you kind of um because you, you kind of like already mentioned this so you kind of have a certain play through a certain path through the level in mind when you when you're designing levels i think usually the way that i make levels is that i like there to be at least at least two or three different paths that you can take and then oh, and okay. then uh exploring like what those paths mean to each kind of player like there's like a there's like a general easy way that you can play a level which is just like you just hold on to all the blood that you have because there's like a there's like there's like a power scaling mechanic between the uh the like character health so like the health quote unquote and their like power level where as you scale up levels you get like more lives But then as you like take damage and spend hypers, you lose like those power levels. And if you take damage when you have no power level, that's when you actually die. So there's like a, a bit of like a management of like what your blood levels could be like and like different ways to like snatch those blood levels. So it's like if a player wants to do like an easy route, they could like interact with a lot of the objects because they have um, the sorceress has this ability where she can like siphon like blood energy out of like anything as long as she's like touching it and it's like not destroyed. So you can actually like I'll have like a like a array like a lineup of uh 
what's, what is what is the word like graves i'll have like a lineup of graves and they'll all have like different health values and stuff like that and they'll have like stability and as you like rub up against them you'll start like building up like blood meter to like shoot your level up and that gives you like ah. more power and like more access to these hypers and stuff like that um and then like figuring out like if that's the way that the player wants to play then maybe maybe if they're building up all this blood they want a hyper here so maybe i want to put a bunch of skull enemies here so that way when they hyper they can mm. collect all these skulls and then when they hit the three thousand point they activate the hyper and then the rank shoots up and if they're going to shoot the rank up then maybe i should put these enemies right here and it's just like a like a okay. nice back and forth of just like I come up with an idea and then I think of all the different ways that a player might approach it. And then I try to put at least something there for that kind of player. So that way there's like multi instead of, cause I'm not, a, I'm not a huge fan of when there's only one way to solve a level. I like it when it's like more, more fluid and gives you like a little bit more options. Although there's nothing inherently wrong with having like one way to, to make, to make a level. That's just not how I do it personally. Yeah, it kind of depends, I guess, right? There's like some games that feel more like puzzle-ish where you have to figure out how to get through this and but some feel more like here's some enemies and here's some tools and you go ahead and figure it yeah. out, right? And there's, there's all sorts of gradations in between, I guess. So you talked about how you kind of discover the level as you develop it, as you know, you are in your beautiful <laughs> luxurious editor and you place things in and you, you get ideas and you follow up on the ideas. Um, but was there a phase at some point where you sat down on a piece, like maybe with a piece of paper or something like a text document and like sketched out roughly, you know, where the levels are going? Um, I would say maybe not on maybe not on paper so much. I used to do that a lot more back then, and honestly, I think that's something I'm planning on getting back into. Although the the main reason that I would want to use paper is for like um, more like storyboarding and like putting together sequences of things that I would want to do at some point because it's a little harder to carry like the idea of what I what I want to do in text. But I do write a lot mm -hmm. of text documents, like a whole lot. Almost any time I come up with a game, I'm like, I'm like, all right, Google, Google Docs, bam, design document. What's the idea? What do I want to do with this stuff? What are the potential ways this could go in? Stuff like that. Um, but when it comes to like actually making levels, usually I'll have like like a basic framework of like the, I guess a better way to put it is like the area, because I think that's the way that I tend to design levels. It's more in like areas, and then each area, like it's basically just how I did it in Joy Lancer. It's like area one is like the city, area two is the underground. These have specific gimmicks that are like meant to be consistent themes throughout the level, and then and I basically just do that in this game also. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So it's so like just broad ideas, and then you jump in, and then you work yeah. on the ideas. Yeah, and then I just see what happens from there, okay. basically. So what about the enemies? When do the enemies come in? Is that something that you already have prepared coming into a level design? Or is that something that you develop as you work on the level? I think that's something that definitely tends to come a little, I don't want to say at the same time, but like maybe slightly after coming up with the actual level. Because usually when I'm designing a level, I'll come up with the general aesthetic of the level. And then I will come up with like a, like a theme for like what I want the pace of the level to be. And then I will start thinking of the enemies that would fit in the context of that thing, whether it be reusing the enemies from the previous level, adding in new enemies, and deciding, like, are these enemies going to behave differently than all these other ones? Are there going to be, like, skin swaps with, like, more HP or something like that? Um, and then after that, I would go into building, like, a really basic framework for, like, a level based on just, like, placing props. And then I put the enemies in there. And then from then on, it becomes like the actual like, okay, now what is this level going to be? What do I want to put here? Do I want this to like, do I want screen? Do I want the screen to stop here? Do I want her to go faster here? Stuff like that. That's super interesting. Yeah. So um, you also talked about how you um, split the level into like, because you, you said like, you know, the first level is kind of like actually four smaller levels that are shorter. So you're already doing a bit of a chunking, but within each level, do you also like each encounter is treated as a kind of like a chunk and then come, comes next encounter, next encounter, or is it more of a continuous thing? Yeah, I would definitely think it more in like the direction of like each stage has like a certain number of like encounters that are like central to the stage. And then everything in between is just like the things that keep the player moving and like challenged and engaging with the game and like going through at like the, the usual scrolling speed. And then they get to the encounter and they do that and then 
vice versa, repeat, repeat until the level is over, basically. Well, something that, that still bothers me, something that I've still kind of like not, haven't wrapped my head around fully is, you know, because you said like you, you, five levels is not enough, right? So h- how did you decide that you want to have more? Like how how did you arrive at, at your at your values? I think I think the funny thing with uh, Bolt Sorceress and like and Joy Lancer and all these different games that I've made is that in a way, I still do fall follow by the five level six level rule it's just that because of the way that i section them off it ends up being technically more like like 24 to 30 levels that are just like Mm. smaller bite Mm. pieces um and i think usually i find that the five level format is actually like a really good uh i don't remember what the term for the use for in english but it's like when you have like the the like beginning and then you have like the rising action and you have like a little dip oh, and yeah, then you yeah. have like the rising action again uh, then the climax five the five x structure yeah, basically, and like right? falling action and you climax again then you have like the big thing at the end i find that that format actually works really really well for a lot of the ideas that i make because that's usually just how i design things in general because that's just like the kinds of games that i've played and enjoyed and i have really enjoyed that format because it feels it feels like cohesive and it feels like something you can like understand immediately, but it doesn't feel predictable. You know what I mean? It's like these points, these points don't have to be rigid, but because you have like these like identifying like chapters, basically, it lets you direct like it lets you direct the roller coaster to be more like orderly, more like the way that you actually want it to feel. And it lets you section off these parts of the game that have these specific moments and then make those things that the player can choose to focus on if they want to. So it's like maybe level two mm-hmm. is like before it gets like really crazy in level three, it's like there's like this really like striking point in level two that people like and maybe they want to play that section of levels like a lot and go for high scores in those levels, which you can do because each like each like pocket of levels has like its own leaderboard and each individual level inside of those pockets of levels would also have their own leaderboard. So there's like challenges to like <laughs> actually go for individual high scores and all of these things on top of doing like the long run where you try to go through everything at once and get like the big one CC high score at the end. Um, but so when you when you're talking about the length, so you split it up into into a bit of a finer chapters, uh, and for each chapter you have like this uh, narrative idea of where you're going, maybe like some kind of like a. Uh, uh, set piece that you're working towards or some kind of like emotional impact that you're working towards um do you have like at least an idea of you know how long the game is going to be is that something that 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 is that guides your uh, decisions i would i would say it does i would say that there's like usually like a minimum length that i would try to hit with most of the things that i make which usually falls in like a the way that i put it is like it's maybe slightly higher than a, than average but that's mostly like mm-hmm kind of incidental in a way not like really like super being like oh i gotta if this game's 30 minutes i gotta make I'm gonna have more. Make this from 45 minutes it's more like i have an idea yeah. that's like 30 minutes but then there might be like some extra parts that make it like a little longer stuff like that um but at the same time length is something that's like very fluid to me so it's like maybe maybe i'll come up with a game and i'll be like this game is about 40 minutes long and then maybe i'll come up with like a really good idea that makes the game a little longer, but fits into the game better. And so I'll be like, all right, let's do this. But then maybe as I do that, maybe I'll decide this part probably doesn't need to be as long because it's not as important. And it's a little, almost like a little fillery. So it's like, maybe I could trim that part out or like add like extra bonus levels as part of that, that you can choose to engage with if you want to, but they're not part of like an arcade run or anything like that. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm like super strict about it, but I do like to try and hit like a, a bare minimum of length in a game. Mm. So rough idea, but you're very flexible. I imagine that especially when you're working on a game that's a bit painting outside of the lines when it comes to shmups and focusing very much on like these character interactions and on the narrative elements, that these things tend to kind of like, they want space, yeah. right? Yeah, and I think that's also why the the ability to like section things out and also the way the ability to like put things off into like different side modes that don't have to stray too far from like the basic formula is a pretty good way to handle it i think actually when it comes to the kinds of games that i'm making where they're like a little bit more like there's a little bit more thought and like like emphasis put into the stories where it's like in shmups in platformers are like action games in general 
especially like independent ones, no shade intentionally, there's usually not that much thought put into like the story or the vibe or the aesthetic or anything like that. You, they're usually just trying to find- You're a spaceship, you're shooting yeah. at aliens in space, go. <laughs> uh, or it's like, yeah, it's just trying to be like very functional and like do the thing that it needs to do, which is great. And like a totally valid way to approach making games. But that's just like, that's not, that's not really how I do stuff. I'm like, really, if I didn't start, if I didn't make games, I would probably be making like, like cartoons or comics or stuff like that. So the like, the story aspect of these things has always been really important to me because that's like something that I think about when I'm like creating the fundamental building blocks of an idea, even like usually if I'm like making a new game, I'll come up with like a character and then like maybe one or two other things. And then I really start thinking about why that character exists, why these things exist, why these things connect to each other, why these things would happen and stuff like that. So being able to like put those things in like their own little box where you can you can interact with this if you want to, but if you just want like the the hardcore arcade just in and out experience, bam, we got we got a mode for you. So I like to like try and fit in like both of these things because I really like story games and I also really really like arcade games. So these are two things that I value a lot, and I don't want them to be separate. But I know that there's like a a certain degree of separation that usually has to be taken into account because you know in indulging in a story and indulging in the action are not diametrically opposed but they're like different enough that you know if you go too hard in one way it'll really anger the people who want this and vice versa on that so trying to find that balance by including both and then that just gives the game more content anyways which i love i love giving games content so i think that's probably the way that i would just make everything in general yeah like like making sure that the, the, the action narratives are supporting each yeah. other something i am I'm, i'm still kind of like want to because again it's i, I you know if, if you're for our people out there who've been watching the previous interviews you already know all the questions but something that still bothers me is um, or something that, that i'm kind of strict, still struggling with is that there is this constant like chicken and egg situations when you're designing a game because the game's not quite finished but you already have to de develop a level for it so i was wondering how much um, were things like, you know, the player's abilities or the scoring system. How much was that already kind of set in stone before you started working on your levels? Or is that, again, something that developed as you were working on the levels? I think with this game in particular, the, the, base, the basic conceit of this game was very simple. I wanted to make, I wanted to make a game that felt like, uh, this, this might be a little... This might be a little obscure for some folks, but maybe, but maybe not. But there's a uh, there's a website called Pixel Joint where a lot of very talented pixel artists upload like a lot of really cool art there. And there was a very striking piece that I saw there a couple years ago. Um, it was like a it was like a like a mock up of a an interpretation of Bayonetta as a shmup, and it was like it's really really cool looking. Like the art is just amazing. It's just like such a cool idea. So I was like, I want to, like, I've wanted to do something like that for years now. But then I was like, but I don't want to, like, do the Bayonetta thing, but I do want that, like, general, like, idea and that vibe and stuff like that. So what other way could I take it? And at that time, I was really, really in, uh, looking into, like, the Gungrave series. Um, and I was just like, that mm -hmm. character is, like, such a striking, like, early 2000s, like, PlayStation 2 character that is just, like, just like a dude <laughs> okay, just like yeah. a dude with two guns and like a big trench coat and he's just like this massive silhouette and he's got a giant <laughs> oh, coffin yeah. that turns into a gun and i'm just like i need to put these two things together and so the basic idea was pretty much just that like but then putting like schmuck mechanics in it and then everything else just kind of came came after that basically and the game is totally i can totally see how you arrived at the at that design that's amazing yeah i even wanted to go wow. even farther with that like whole vibe with like in a in gun grade like when you're when you have like a there's like a basic shooting animation but he's like boom, 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 just like swinging his arms around <laughs> everywhere it's just like spray of bullets everywhere and i was just like man i want to do that but that's way too much animation work actually <laughs> so i kind of do like more like a Devil May cry thing where it's just like you just point the gun and then you, you just shoot it 
Yeah, I mean, it works. It works as well. I think that, you know, the ideas are there and, and you can really pick them up. So what, I, what I'm getting from this is that you really wanted to have a certain vibe, a certain character with certain abilities. And that's where you started the design with, basically. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the thing that the, everything was hinged on. And everything else is just like fueling that. Yeah. What, what, that ser- idea, what right? serves this basic idea that I have for this character doing these things? Okay, that makes sense. And then, like, as I go through, I just come up with, like, all these creative ideas for just, like, how these things intertwine. And then I, like, I came up with, like, Death, like, the the Wraith who, like, follows her around and is just, like, really obsessed with her because she, like, fell in love with her accidentally and she's never felt love before. So she's, like, overwhelmed by what to even do with this. So she just goes insane and chases her around. It's just, like, all these, like, all these, like, random things that, like, probably wouldn't be seen normally. It's just, like, just throw it in there and just, like, make it make it unique and just, like, yeah. see what people think. That's super cool, but but no, that I think that that gives us a, a good insight because quite often people are, are not quite sure, you know, what kind of abilities do I want to have in my game, and I think this is a good example of how you can kind of think through lateral thinking, being like, okay, actually, this is not something that is designed uh, or decided in the gameplay itself. That's actually something that's designed in the vision for the game. This is what the ab- kind of abilities I want to have, yeah. and this is what drives my decision making, and not, you know, uh, you know mechanical yeah stuff, it's like you obviously know. you want to make like a good fun game but making it yeah. it's more for me it's more making the things that are fun in service of the idea or like the like aesthetic or like what the character would do i want it to like feel i want it to feel like it all falls in line with each other but still there is like uh, you still have to at some point you know in some kind of editor or in some kind of code you have to type in okay this is the speed at which the player is moving and these are the speed at which the bullets are moving and so how did you arrive at these things is that something that again came like from gut feeling is that something that changed over the time of the development on the game or is that something that you settled on early i'd say a fair amount of it is like gut feeling um i would i would even say that like the stuff that's in the game currently is like not super final because in the in the updated engine that we're going to be putting in Godot, I'll be able to actually mess with those values in the in the actual editor itself. A dangerous thing to do. <laughs> yeah, so then I'll be able to like actually like decide what I want the character to actually feel like in the end. And those are and those are variables that are also just constantly changing as the as the as the game is built and like as I start to see things more and like as I start to guide like how I want the character to feel and like the difficulty and like how all these different things like influence the difficulty in various ways. Like you can make, you can do like a very slight adjustment to the player speed and it can totally change like the way that your game feels. And similarly, sometimes you have to account for those changes in other parts of the game. So it's like, if I speed up the character, maybe it makes it really easy for them to sidestep certain bullets to not start making the bullets a little faster. And if the bolts are going to be a little faster, maybe I need to turn down the amount of them so it doesn't become overwhelming immediately and then have the have that part of the game sort of just slowly fade in rather than be like a like a like a quicker like a quicker jump. Part of this ability stuff is also the scoring aspect of it. That's I I have to say admit I didn't ask didn't drill down on this question on the previous episodes. Sorry about that for people watching this, but I know a lot of people want to figure this out. You know because scoring is quite often such an important part of the way game shmups are being discussed in the community. Definitely. So what are your thoughts about how you develop the scoring system? For me, the way that I usually develop scoring systems is that I think about the things that a player who would want to go for score wants to do, and then I think about the way those things would want would need or want to be tuned in order to be in service of that. And there's usually some like really big thing that's like I don't want to say it's like central to the scoring, but it's like a very important part of like taking advantage of all the scoring opportunities that are in the game. And in this case, the big scoring thing is the skull system and like collecting skulls because those are like a consistent level of points that go it's like it starts out at 100 points and then as you collect one it goes up in value by 100 points so you collect 30 of them it goes to 3000 and that's like the max cap and at that point every skull that you collect is worth 3000 points and it doesn't go up or anything like that Mm. and when you take damage it goes down um but when you hit that 3000 point you have like a the, the skull kind of starts like glowing and stuff like that. And then at that point, if you spend hyper, any skulls that you create turn into these three big blue skulls that are worth like twice as much, that are worth twice as much score. So there's actually points 
in in levels usually where I'll design like a lot of bone based enemies to appear. And then that'll be like, if you've got like all these skulls, then you just, you just pop it and then you just go boom. And then it's just like, they're all gone. It's just like all these skulls all over the place. And in exchange for doing that and getting like this huge strength boost and this huge surge in like score, the difficulty of the game goes up and it scrolls up and it continues to scale up constantly as you do these things. And like the ways to turn them down are usually not enough to completely combat how much higher you're going. If you're like really pushing the scoring. So if you're like, going super hard on the scoring, the game will become tougher, but then that will give you more opportunities to score and maybe even more opportunities to collect resources, which you can then use to score more and then making all the different elements of the game tie into that in a way that like introduces an interesting risk reward because the more that you use hypers, the more vulnerable you become because then your base level of like firepower goes down and the lower it goes and then it hits zero and then you take damage and you die. So if you use it too much, you mm. become too weak unless you know of these points where you can like build up blood and like start to start the chain of power all over again. And because doing that feels really fun, mm. it's like one of those things where it be, it becomes like a lot of fun to like design all these different ways that the player can like activate hyper in this level to make all these crazy things happen, but then make the game a lot harder. And then like the, the, the players who get really invested and really good in the scoring are going to do like these absolutely incredible runs where it's just like maximum rank and there's bullets everywhere and they're flying at Mach 4 and they're just not taking damage. And they're like, they're like <laughs> doing like strategic, like panic bombing, like save bombing, like right when they get hit. So they get like these big bonuses all over the place and collect more skulls and then pop hyper. And there's just like the cycle repeats over and over and over again. Okay. So you have like, like this core scoring idea like the, the core scoring mechanic and you make sure that everything taps into it somehow right yeah exactly so speaking of i mean the game is not finished you're still working on this but still like something that is kind of like uh, interesting to hear is like whether the um, um, game designers work on those shmups whether they actually beat the game on the highest difficulty i think that's uh, do i understand correctly that this is not going to be a difficult this is not going to be a huge challenge for you yeah i think i think the thing for me is that i really like making like those super hard difficulties and usually like the the max difficulty is usually something where I'll like play it over and over and over again and make sure it's not completely impossible. And then I'm like, great, that's perfect. Because I know that if I make it <laughs> not completely impossible for me, there's someone out there who's like like a Moglar or something like that, who's just like a super top super player, and they're just gonna they're gonna figure out the secret and then like solve the puzzle, and I'm gonna be like, that's amazing. <laughs> So, so you're pushing the difficulty as far as you can for yourself, yeah. and then, and then, yeah, and then maybe I'll like okay. compensate like up or down a little bit depending on how I'm feeling. <laughs> uh, one last question, or we're kind of like wrapping up slowly, but um, so, so you have all those tools, you have like all these ideas, and and you know you you put in all this stuff, and at what point do you decide? Okay, this level now is finished. You know how how do you do you uh, decide those things? How do you what was your goal when when working on it? You know, honestly, back then I used to be very very loosey goosey about that. I would always be like very open minded to like like the level. It's like a certain point where it's just like. You get older, you make a bunch of stuff, and then you realize that there is like a point where like a level should end and then like move on to the next one. And nowadays, I kind of tend to lean more towards just like, I, it's kind of like a gut feeling. It's just kind of like, I just feel like I've done everything that I can with this level. And if I add anything else, it's just gonna, it's just gonna drag on and just like not actually be as fun as it would have been if I had just cut that part out. So nowadays, I'm more towards like slimming things down and like keeping them compact. And I think, changing the way that I think about levels in general, especially like levels and shmups, because it's like a very, like everyone has like the, the format that they're used to and they just like do that because that's the one that works. And there's like, there's like all these other spaces that I feel like haven't been explored very much. And I kind of just want to explore those a little bit more, like the shorter, the shorter bite size kind of approach to it. And then just like putting a bunch of those in there. And then just like seeing seeing how it goes, basically, because really, I, I honestly, I have no idea if the idea that I have is even going to be good or if anyone's even going to like it, but may as well try, you know? Yeah, so you're you're kind of like more of a, more to the point, uh, deciding what you want to say. And then if you feel like you said it, then just move on. Yeah, and, that's why I think designing and, and by encounters is like a really smart way in general to just like approach making yeah. games because you have, this is like, 
it's like uh it's almost like you're writing it and then you're writing a sentence and then you put the period there and you're like all right that's the point write a sentence period write a sentence period or just have like this is the point where the sentence is going to stop what am i going to fill in in this sentence that feels like it's not going on too long but also not too short and then just like balancing that around based on what i'm going for with what i'm going for with that specific level in particular it's super interesting to to hear how you're you know, so driven by the, by the by the vibes, by the narrative and so forth, because it feels like this is something that's, especially in like something like shmups, I, f- I feel like this may be a bit uh, underappreciated, you know, how much this helps out with all those decisions, you know, the abilities, the length of the thing, the, the themes of the level, all those things are so, are I feel a lot easier to decide when you have like this core idea at the beginning. Yeah, definitely. And you can tell like, a lot of the older games that get popular and stay popular, it's because they nail they nail those things in a way that a lot of other games just like don't, and then they become like a like a fleeting memory. Like you know, everyone talks about like the Dodo Pachi series, but there's a reason those games are so popular. It's because the the way that they organize the set pieces and have stuff like come in and like the way that they like have the bullets fly around. It's like it is like. This is like a, a hot button topic right now in shmups, but it's like the the cinematic mm-hmm. the cinematic shmup where it's like it's like trying to focus on like the spectacle and stuff like that, and like trying to have that be like the core of like the the like level or like the idea. But a lot of these older games did that; they just did it in a way that was more yeah. subtle and more nuanced. You don't notice immediately because they didn't have like all of these things to use and all these like new tools and like all these like new ways of thinking about games they were just like this is the game and now we're gonna like fashion these levels in a way that like like is interesting and feels like you're doing something rather than just like flying over like some backgrounds and shooting at some stuff you know and i really value that kind of stuff in those kinds of games which is why they're like so important in like the lexicon of shmups and why people still play them to this day yeah those games are memorable because they they, you you weren't just flying over some landscape there 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 was actually some really good narrative decision making you know what you see in the backgrounds and how they build up to a final boss yeah encounter. it's like you like you play like stage five in a dodonpachi daiojo and if you played the first dodonpachi you start seeing all these old bosses that just like come up out of nowhere with their old bullet patterns while you're on a background that is actually just the second level from dodonpachi but colored down and it's like oh man this is awesome it's like we're heading right back into where all this all this stuff has been going down now we're gonna get the big bad but they have all these badass is guarding them that i fought before and now i have to kill them all before i can get to the top and it's like it's just like such a sick vibe yeah i get it i get it and not maybe with this game but i had similar experiences with other shmups so older shmups as well um okay so here's some leftover questions which i okay so your game is called bullet sorceress are you a bit miffed that there was already bullets witch out there no actually i almost i almost took that idea like wholesale because i think that bullet witch is like that's a game that i wish i made because i would i would make it so much better but uh you know i actually part of like the design of the game is actually kind of influenced by that game in some way also like those kind of there's just like that like ps2 360 vibe of games that are just like really rough around the edges and not quite there but you're just really sold on the original idea that they were pitching to you before you realized it wasn't that idea. I'm just like so obsessed with games like that, that I just like, I want to just like tap into that energy, but then like try and make something better out of it. Yeah, there's like this something about this PS2 era, kind of like not really mainstream, but kind of like a bit of a B movie kind of games, which sometimes are, are they, they hit the, uh, the right spot. Yeah, and they're, they're so refreshing nowadays where it's just like every game is like, feels like it has to be like this big, like, super triple a cinematic experience with like all these realistic graphics and these like believable characters and stuff like that it was just like could you imagine the kind of games that people could make if you just like took that same ethos and then just brought it into the current era you get armored core 6 which everyone loves and that's just a (laughs) ps2 game Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, we we need definitely, I think, more experimentation. Like not quite indie, but also not quite triple A. Something in between. I think this space is is, is still a bit, a bit. Um, yeah, there could be more happening there. Um, okay, I'm so. 
I, something, I haven't played the game, so I don't know quite how that works. Maybe this is a bit late to ask this question, but something I was wondering, and I'm asking because there's another follow-up question. Um, so you can change like the direction. You have two guns, and you can change the direction in which the guns you find your guns. And how do you like which button do you press to change the direction? Um, so it it's actually the the bullet the the button layout of the game is formatted a lot like uh, Dolompachi Daikatsu or Dolompachi Resurrection if you're a, a Steam player. Um, and that game is the A button is the, the focus shot, B button is bomb, C button is free shot, and D button is hyper. And in Bullet Sorceress, when you're using the free shot um, and you just move around, the other gun that you have will just point in that direction. So if you're just holding the free ah, shot, okay, you can okay. like move left and right and you can like kind of spray bullets all over the place. And then when you get into an angle that you like, you hold the A button instead, and then she'll like lock into like that formation. And you just hold that A button. You can just like keep on shooting like at the side, in front, or just both up front, stuff like that. So you hold one button to move move guns around, and you hold another button to keep that position. Yeah, and it's like and it's like how uh, how uh, in a, a lot of games you hold the auto button to shoot your normal shot, and then you hold the A button to shoot your laser. It's basically like that. Only instead, it's like ah. you, lo you lock on, you don't lock on. Okay, so the question this this dives into this would have a bonus question, a bonus design question, because it's something that came up throughout the tutorial and development that we were discussing in the community. So you have like four buttons in your game, right? And usually, you know, quite quite often they have at least three buttons. You have like a normal fire, focus fire, and then a bomb. But what if you for some reason decided, you know, crazy idea that you're working in an engine that only has two buttons? Uh, just like your gut feeling, what would you do? Would you uh, make it auto fire or would you still have like a dedicated uh, shoot button? And then kind of like hash out, you know, maybe no focus or maybe no bomb, like or maybe some kind of other solution for the other two abilities. How would you do that? I think I think the way that I would probably do it because I, I think about stuff like that all the time. I'll, I'm, I'm gonna let folks in on a little secret. I think less buttons is better in most cases, unless the game is so complex that you need another button in order to, like, in order to make it playable for humans um but i think when you when you add like a lot of buttons to a game you kind of muddy the design a little bit because unless those buttons are like part of like really core features and if those are like really core features there's probably another place that you could put them um although of course doing that also influences the design of your game obviously um a, a, a highlight example being the dotenpachi games where you have the you have dotenpachi daiojo which has uh, bomb and hyper are on the same button and if you have hyper that mm -hmm. is prioritized and then you have like uh, uh, Daifukatsu where it's its own separate button so you can have a hyper button and also a bomb button in case you need to bomb but you want to keep your hyper stacked um, and it really just depends on like the kind of game that you want to make and the format of stuff but in context of this game I think what I would probably do is change the way that shooting works so that way when you press the button it would shoot out like uh, like a cluster of shots, like maybe shoot like a kind of like like a like an older shmup where it's like you press like a you press the fire button, it shoots like five it shoots like five or six shots, and then you hold the button like and that would give you like the focus fire. So that way you could you you have to tap, but you could tap slowly, so it wouldn't be as hard on your wrists because that's something that I'm very very thoughtful of when I try to design the games is like how much strain is this going to be on the player's hands because that's like a very important thing in basically everything and a lot of a lot of developers yeah, yeah. tend to ignore that although they're getting a lot better about it nowadays i will say that but yeah i would basically just put the two shot types on the same button and i would probably just put bomb and hyper on the same button and then maybe like if this is like in the case of like porting the game or something like that i would probably change the levels a little bit to accommodate for the way that the button layout has changed because that's just like that's just like a thing that i think is smart to do in general i'm not really a big fan of when developers take a game and they port it to the phone and then they put like touchscreen controls on it, but then the levels are exactly the same because then it's just like mm. so much of it just doesn't work because you can't you can't be that accurate with a touchscreen. You just you just can't, you know? Like I've texting has never been the same for me ever since the smartphone era. Like I just I'm so bad at it now. I hate doing it because it's just like I can't just slide open my phone and just type on a keyboard. So it's like when you design a game and you have to like trim the fat in in that sort of way i think other parts of the game have to change to accommodate that which is something that you actually saw a lot more often in the old days where 
uh, the platforms that you played games on were a lot more different from each other. They had way different processing power. The way that they process sprites and music and all that stuff was totally different. So you, a lot of times you couldn't just take the same game and port it over. You had to change something about it because otherwise the game just didn't work correctly. And sometimes that meant getting rid of things and sometimes that meant adding things. And it just depends on like the kind of thing that you want to make. But I feel like when you change the button layout, you have to change the game at least in some way because the execution does make a big difference into how you design the levels. That, that's an excellent point. Yeah, yeah. It used to be like I have to think there's a really good document about how they ported R type to the Game Boy because they had to, like, you couldn't just like tra- transition the code. You had to rebuild it from scratch. And then the guy who made it, it like, never played a shmup before. It's, it's, it's a crazy thing. And he did such an amazing job on that one. Yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome port. Uh, that's actually like, that's probably one of my favorite ways to play both R type games, if I'm being honest, is on the Game Boy. And maybe that's just nostalgia because that's the first one that I played. But I just remember it being just like so awesome that it's just like you have this really cool, like detailed shmup and it like actually ran pretty good on the Game Boy. Yeah. Despite the fact that they had to make so many concessions, it's just like it's really interesting to look at. And obviously, if they just tried to port it straight, that it just would not have worked at all. No, no. And they had to like trim down the levels. You know, there's not as many levels and so forth, but it works so well. Yeah. It's kind of like a, like a, our type abridged in a way yeah it's yeah. just kind of like the best the, our type greatest hits where it's like it's all the parts of the levels that are cool it's none of the parts that drag on it's just like a nice con- it's just a nice tight little package that's true that's true that's how i feel about it as well um so let's now move on let's so you are still working on bullet sorceress um i'm I'm, I'm not probably not going to even ask about any kind of release date or anything. Oh, You're yeah. just like in it right now, right? Yeah. You're just porting to Godot, Godot and then... Yeah, and then just like going through and finishing the game from there. I'm definitely... The the older I get, the more that I kind of... I kind of start to... I, you know, like the, the Duke Nukem Forever story? It'll be done when it's done. The older I, the older I get, the <laughs> yeah, more yeah, yeah. I'm just like, you know, George Broussard was actually... He was kind of spitting on that one. I, I definitely... <laughs> had an idea yeah, there. I'm definitely with him on that one because like... Like going through and making making Joy Lancer and like the whole process of like getting that game out in people's faces and going on early access and like trying to get these release dates sorted out. But then like you're like, OK, this is going to be our release date. And then something happens and then it's just like, all right, we have to push this back. We have to push this back. We have to push this back. Oh, we're going homeless now. So we're going to do this when we can do this. And then it's just like, honestly, nowadays, I almost kind of feel like. I almost feel like that old way of like really trying to like super promote your game, like as you're working on it and building it and like showing it off and stuff like that. I feel like that's getting kind of outdated in the industry. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, back then we used to have like all these complaints where it's just like, these games are coming out and it's just like, why aren't they, why aren't they advertising it? Why can't, I can't see like any of the advertising anywhere, but now there's just so much stuff coming out all the time from indie, from triple a, from like, all corners of the industry that's like you know you could announce your game is coming out next month everyone's gonna forget in four days that you even announced that game in the first place because all these yeah if, if i can play it now then what's the point yeah, right? and it's like you look at like some of the interesting trends in the industry like let's think about like metroid prime remastered that game had no build-up no advertisement no follow-up whatsoever they just dropped it on a nintendo direct and it exploded and everyone loves it hi-fi rush we didn't know that game existed and then they just announced it randomly on a on a like thing and then it's out the an hour later and people are downloading it and they're having a great time and it's awesome and it's like building up all this hype it's like top 10 on steam and like and then you hear about stuff like hollow knight silk song where people are just like memeing about it never coming out and stuff like that (laughs) and then and then you know what no news for like a year or two you're gonna wake up one day bam it's out 10 out of 10 game, best game ever made. Suddenly you're not even mad about the fact that you didn't know what happened to this game for two years because it's out now and you got to play all these other awesome games in the interim and now you get to play this awesome game that you were looking forward to that now exists in your mind again because it's out and you can play it. And it's just, there's so much pressure that developers put on themselves to like meet these like specific deadlines and like demands and stuff like that when honestly a lot of the time they're not even experienced enough to know when their game is going to be done like you know when you're young and you're just working on the thing you're just like okay this can be done in a month this can be done in two months and then the reality (laughs) of development hits you and then next thing you know 
next thing you know, you've refactored your game nine times and it's not going to be out for like another year. So in a way, I almost kind of feel like release, like announcing release dates and stuff like that when you're not confident that the thing is just going to be done. It's just like, it's, it's not good. You're just going to end up like crunching yourself and putting all this unnecessary pressure onto yourself that's ultimately just going to get in the way of making a good game. And then, you know, you lose the identity of the thing that you were making because you're trying so hard to like make it appeal to people and try to like get this like this uh, promotion wave going and you're like trying to talk to publishers so they can help you promote the thing and like honestly nowadays if you just like if your game just looks good and you're and you're ready and you just you put it out there and then you just do the advertising afterwards and let people connect with it in some way because people are also a lot more open-minded about playing new games nowadays so like you're not even like at that much more risk compared to if you try to advertise it the whole time, announce a release date six months in advance, and then like actually hit it. Like no one's no one's gonna remember because Super Mario Wonder came out. There's or, just so much yeah, happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Came out or Hollow Knight Silk Song came out of nowhere. So Shovel Knight Three, something like that. You know, there's just like so many things that are just competing for people's time. And since there's like so much time spent on like Twitter and stuff nowadays, no one has the attention span to even like look at your thing for longer than five seconds anyways so you may as well just make the best thing that you can and when you're ready to release it then you do all that stuff that's the way i see it at least just from like ex- my own personal experience that that is an excellent point i haven't even thought about this but yeah it, it, i totally agree it feels like things have changed like the way we used to make these things the the, the best practices no longer hold water and the environment is different so you you cannot really do it and it's something that's and that's why i really appreciate why you're here something that that's um, it, it saps away the energy as well. Like you, yeah. when you're working on something, you have to commit to it. And then having to also at the same time manage this community and then maybe the feedback you're getting is not really great. And then it feels like, why am I even working on this? Because the people are not like, are complaining about this and that. And yeah. what's even the point? You know? Yeah, and yeah. it's like, ultimately, like, really, the, th- the thing that developers need the most is money. And it's really hard to yeah. get money unless you have like a game that is good enough or close enough to the point where you'd be able to be comfortable asking money for it and even then like something could go wrong and you'll have to start the engine over again because we've had to do that many many times over the last couple years and it's actually it's been very interesting working in video games for the last couple years because i think i think around it was like 2009 2010 where i released my first video game and even just like between then and starting joy lancer in like 2013 2014 like the environment of video games changed so much like itch.io became a thing the steam steam did green light and no one liked it and then they just opened it up anyways and like more of these like publishers have come out like small deals publishers that specifically work with smaller developers and then in that time between working on that game at the start to where we are now like nine years have passed and the industry has changed twice you know like the the trends that were hot are not hot anymore and now they've become niche again but niche in a way where there's like actually an audience for these things now so the audiences for everything that you're making are bigger than ever and and more passionate than ever before and even though like you know twitter is dying and everyone's stressed about it because everyone everyone tweets their devlogs and they're not getting impressions anymore but like there's there's like so many places out there that will just like they're super down with taking a look at your stuff you know you you probably get more reception posting your game on like the shmups discord in the game dev channel than yeah. you would posting it on twitter right now anyways and like you know just yeah. interact interacting with like discords and stuff like that is like nowadays one of the best ways to get promotion for the thing that you're making at least in terms of like making it reach the hardcore base and then you know maybe there's someone in the hardcore base who has enough of a following that it can like springboard into like all these other avenues where suddenly your game is mega popular. And I think that that is probably the best way to approach it is just keep, keep the passion there and just like make the thing you want to make and don't stress out so much about when it's done. Just like try to do it as quick as you can, but be mindful of your own energy and how much it takes to do those things. And just like how much work it is. And don't be, don't be surprised if it takes longer than you thought, because that's just, that's just what making art in general is like. Sometimes these things take a while and that's perfectly fine as long as you have a way to support it in the meantime, which my way has been through taking contract jobs and animating for other people's games. 
to support being able to make the stuff that I want to make. Yeah, I, I think that that's also really good advice, like for for uh, for new devs, aspiring shmup devs coming in. Let's just be mindful that these things yeah. just take time. Don't set and, release dates. That's my advice to you. Do not set a release date <laughs> until you've made at least Add. until you've made at least three games that you've released. Because the games that you mm. have not released, they still count as your games. Remember, mm. uh, John Romero said that Doom was his 100th video game. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was his 100th video game. Yeah, absolutely. Not all those games. <laughs> Don't even talk to me. No, not all those games have <laughs> a light of day. So if that game you didn't finish, it's fine. You, you still made a game that's still experience. That'll, you can still take that with you into the future. That's true. Speaking of, of releasing, so um, again, we're not talking about release dates, but just rough plans. You Where do you want to release Bullet Sorceress? I'm, I'm assuming hi.io, obviously. Uh, probably Steam as well, right? Yeah, uh, I, haven't, I haven't like fully hashed out exactly the release method aside from just putting it on itch. But since we're working with Godot now, there's actually like a lot more opportunities for us to port to other platforms compared to like using Game Maker and having to get in all of those like weird licenses and like monthly fees and all that stuff. And then like, mm. you know, you still have to talk to like platform holders and stuff like that and to like get right, the rights to do that. But the porting process, it seems at least the porting process is a little bit simpler and more easy to understand. And there's lots of games that were made in Godot that are on the switch right now. So it can't be, it can't be that hard. So there's always the possibility of making a Switch port, a PS4, PS5 port, Xbox port. Ultimately, I would love to put games on everything, but I don't know what that's going to look like until we get to the point where it's almost done. I would say, yeah, yeah. I would say I'm very open-minded to it if the right deal comes around. So I won't say no. We'll just say not right now. Good to hear. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers fingers crossed on that one. <laughs> All right, uh, Charlene, we have to. I think we have to wrap it up. I think we recovered most of uh, of the bases. Um, where can people reach you and check out your work? Well, you know, a long time ago, I would say you could check me out on Twitter, but I don't use mm. Twitter anymore because that site is mm. bad now. So now mm. most of the social media that I do is on co-host at Charlene Maximum. That's like the place that I like to go now because there's like. A lot of cool art that gets posted there and like it's it's a better container for the kind of stuff that i want to make because i want to like i like i like writing sort of long form posts and you just you just can't do that on twitter um and it's just like a more pleasant community in general a lot of people are really nice and the tagging system is really nice so it's really easy to find stuff or it's like it's easier than like twitter where it's just like everything is just randomized anyway so you can't look for specific things um, but that's the main. Yeah, point. it feels more like blogging. You feel yeah. used to feel yeah, like it's more like bit. it's more like actual blogging compared to the micro blogging craze of like Twitter and various other websites like that. That I just like. That's just not that's just not the way for me anymore. So I'm on co-host. Um, if you like weird aggressive metal music, I also have a Bandcamp, <laughs> TronMaximum.Bandcamp.com, um, and I'm working on a black metal project right now. Um, and you can also, I have a link to the co-host for my studio, Danger Heart Entertainment, in my profile for my personal co-host account. But I'm not using that a whole lot right now because it's just like nothing's ready enough that I feel like I want to start posting stuff on there. But if you follow both of those accounts, you'll probably get a good idea of when I'm doing stuff and like all that stuff. Aside from that, you'll probably just find me on random discords. I hang out in the Shmups Discord's game dev channel a lot. Um, I am the administrator of SGG Rev 2020. So obviously I have to be there a lot to make sure people aren't setting each other on fire. And uh, I'm also in Shmup <laughs> Junkie server. I'm in like a lot of the bigger the bigger discords for Shmups. So I'm usually hanging out in those places mostly. Um, that's probably the easiest way to contact me because at this at this point what since i'm not using twitter i'm basically just on discord all the time yeah yeah it seems it seems like a i've seen you around for sure for sure and i've seen you give some really excellent feedback in the in the developer channel on on schmups yeah on i like to, you, you might not have noticed just by this interview but i like to go on rants and <laughs> i like to i like to say a lot of points inside of one point so i'm always that's good lots of sentences in that discord so if you want to hear some more of my ridiculous ideas that are kind of shitposty, but not really, you can definitely check out the Shmups Discord and hang out in the Game Dev channel. For sure, yeah. All the links will be down in doobly-doo or post them maybe on the screen. I'm not quite sure. 
It has been a blast, Charlene. Thank you so much for for joining us today. Yeah, man, it's been a it's been a great conversation. I love doing stuff like this, and I'm looking forward to doing more of it in the future. And you know, anytime you want to chat again, I'm always down. I love talking about game design and all this other stuff. It's just like I this is my life, so you know, you gotta love talking about it to some degree. Absolutely, absolutely, definitely. We'll look. We're gonna look what what can do in the future. Uh, but for now, do you have any last words of encouragement for aspiring shmup devs out there? Uh, be open to making mistakes, because a lot of times there are a lot of stories that get told about like the experience of, of being a game developer, and I think a lot of the times the things that get propped up are like the positive feel good stories about how it all worked out and how it was all like, we took a big risk and it worked out in the end. But the the vast majority of stories are from people who had something horrible happen to them that just, and it just didn't work out. And they've just been like, they've been trying over and over and over again. And they're just like, they're like in places where like, maybe they're not like thriving or like out there doing the big thing or anything like that. But they're still like out there just like learning from every mistake that they make in order to make the things that they actually want to create. And in any skill, whether it be video games or painting or driving, riding a bike, you have to screw up before you have a foundation to move forward with. So be open to making those mistakes. It's not the end of the world. If you make a mistake, just learn from it and then just keep on, keep on pushing on. Try not to give up because it's uh, pretty hard out here and you don't want to make it harder for yourself. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Have a good one. Don't make it hard on yourself indeed. Thank you again, Charlene and fingers crossed on Bullet Sorceress. And for you guys out there, if you have any additional questions, be sure to post them in the comments section. If you want to keep an eye out for more of interviews like this, be sure to subscribe. I already have two other interviews with Danbo and Barcock out on the channel, and there is two more coming up in the future. If you want to support my work, I have a coffee setup at coffee.com slash lazydevs. And yes, my supporters usually get early access to those videos if you can't wait that long. For now, thank you so much for watching and see you next time around, guys. Bye bye.